Well, good morning. Some places, they just haven't made the words for you yet. This is one of them. You know, last night we slept so good. So, so good. Even though, you know, it doesn't get dark. But we had some nice rain showers that moved in. Woke up about 2 a.m. this morning to some moose splashing through the water out here. Got a few clips of that. Got a mama moose and a baby moose and then a couple of others. And I don't have words good enough to describe what this place feels like. What it, what it does way deep down. But it's incredible. When you think about moments that your family has shared, you know, there's always funny things that come into play, scary things that come into play, and then beautiful things that come into play for our family. This spot right here, it'll always be in the top 10. Just phenomenal. better in Alaska, huh? It does. Even though we could have spent all our remaining time in Alaska alongside this pristine lake, we still had many more places on our bucket list to check off. And so, it was time to pack up and roll out. But not before leaving things a little bit better than we found them. And in this case, the scattered fishing lures, rods, and other items from our mystery boat needed a bit of tidying up for the next lucky visitor. We later learned from locals that it's not uncommon for residents of the state to bring boats to remote lakes just like this and leave them for the summer so they can fly in with their bush or float plane and have their fishing outfit ready and waiting. It just looks like in this case, a bear must have smelled something tasty inside the tackle box and cracked it open for a treat. Let's just hope he didn't get hooked. This little boat certainly made our lake visit that much more magical and got us thinking about how we could return to the water ourselves. So stay tuned to see what kind of plan we hatched. Peace, be still, my darling. All is well, my darling. Your anxious heart is well bestowed. Boy, we My darling, 
redemptive return to Roosevelt Lake checked off the list, we continued east on the Denali Highway to make our way to another highlight in the hills of Alaska. With our second tour of the Denali Highway behind us, we turn our sights south for Wrangell St. Elias National Park in the hopes of finding camp for the night somewhere along the way. What we didn't realize is we were headed into the height of a salmon run, and we were about to learn just how seriously Alaskans take this event. Not so much for sport as for sustenance, and we were headed straight into the battleground. Well, it looks like it's going to be another long day today. We've run out of free camping options and what is available is just eaten up with all the salmon fishermen. So, so we're taking a risk. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and drive how far? 60 miles. 60 miles up to McCarthy and hope that there's a spot when we get there. If not, might just be sleeping in our seats. Stay tuned, we'll see what we get into. I think, I think we found camp for the night. And you hear that, our favorite sound. It's almost midnight. <laughs> it is almost midnight, which is 2 a.m. Utah time, where we just came from. What a beautiful drive, what a beautiful place. And look what we've got right here behind us. That's not a roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> this is an old trestle bridge. Just phenomenal. Just beautiful. All right, let's get a quick sleep and then finish the rest of this road and go check out a really beautiful old town first thing in the morning. We'll see you guys on the flip side. Thank you. Simple concept. Yeah. At the end of a 61 mile long gravel road, 
lies the historical town of McCarthy, Alaska. Situated in the heart of Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve, this small collection of cabins, storefronts, saloons, and hotels was once a bustling hub of commerce and entertainment for the weary miners of the nearby mines. While the nearby town of Kennecott had sufficient enough operations to provide for the basic needs of the workers, the company managed town had policies which forbade the more salacious vices like drinking, gambling, and the like. So the red light district of McCarthy quickly sprang up along the banks of the river, a safe distance away from the strict enforcements of Kennecott. Okay, I was like, I don't want to like push too hard and look like a dummy. Okay. This hub of libertarian activity was sometimes targeted by the U.S. government during the Prohibition years, but the inbound trains would sound a special whistle when the U.S. Marshal was on board, so the town folk could greet him with wide smiles and empty taps, avoiding any unnecessary conflict of interest until he again boarded the train for civilization. <laughs> How is it? We're just doing a burger tour of Alaska here. Yeah, that's why I picked the chicken sandwich. I was like, eh, I've had too many burgers. Up. Yeah. Oh, this looks good. <laughs> yeah. It looks good. <laughs> After a quick lunch at the saloon, we hopped on a shuttle bus and made our way up the mountain to the town of Kennecott. While this region's commercial mining history began in the summer of 1900, the existence of large copper deposits were no secret to the native Athena Athabascan people who had been collecting, trading, and making tools from copper nuggets found in this area centuries before Clarence Warner and Tarantula Jack Smith climbed to the edges of the Kennecott Glacier and noticed what appeared to be large green splotches of strange plant growth dotting the cliffs in the distance. After hiking the difficult terrain for a closer look at this odd site, what they found instead were massive chunks of copper jutting from the hillside, tarnished in a brilliant green from the effects of oxidation. After testing the samples they had collected from the site, it was revealed that this copper ore had purity levels of up to 70%, or better put, one of the richest copper deposits ever discovered. But there was one looming problem. All this copper was virtually worthless without a way to mine it and move it across creeping glaciers, raging rivers, and towering mountains to the coastline where it could be loaded on the ships bound for smelting facilities much further south in Tacoma, Washington. Undeterred and in the face of many naysayers, a group of wealthy investors were combined to form the Alaska Syndicate and began pumping funds and workers into the undertaking. Work on this daunting task began by transporting building materials and mining equipment to the site using dog sleds and horses. Eventually, a steamboat was procured and after disassembly was carried piece by piece over the mountains from Valdez to be reassembled in the Copper River and began hauling the heavier equipment needed for mining, crushing, and processing the ore. None of this infrastructure mattered without the most critical piece of the puzzle, an artery to move the copper to the coast. So, in 1908, work began on the Copper River Railway to connect the now named Bonanza Mine Site with the coastal town of Cordova, which was a staggering 196 miles away. After four years of excavation, the erection of 129 bridges, the overcoming of countless setbacks from weather, and $25 million invested, the first train arrived at the now bustling mining town of Kennecott. The train was promptly loaded with $250,000 worth of copper ore and sent on its way beginning a process that over its 27 years of operation would transport 4,500,000 tons of rich copper ore valued at $200 million to the lower 48, where it would be smelted and processed for use in a country that was quickly becoming electrified with the copper wire. Oh, and if you're curious, that's equivalent to almost $4 billion in today's currency. I think it's safe to say the investment and effort put into this operation was well worth it. After the mines began to play out, maintenance and operating costs increased. And so with copper prices plummeting, the inevitable end came to these two towns. As the last electrical generator came to a shuddering stop, light bulbs winked out in homes and businesses as the miners and their families boarded the Copper River Railway for the very last time. 
and said goodbye to their time in the heart of the last frontier. Both communities became ghost towns almost overnight and remained in their mostly undisturbed state for years until curiosity began to bring new people back into the heart of the wilderness, sparking a new boom in the form of tourism and restoration. As we wandered the streets and walked in the footsteps of those who took part in this impressive human endeavor, we couldn't help but be awed by the work these hardy, ingenious, and resolute people had accomplished. Today, another monumental effort has been undertaken to reclaim these ruins from decay and preserve their history for ages to come. Yeah. Yeah. Nice and easy. Yeah. Four or five grilled cheese. <laughs> here. Join us next week as our adventure continues to slowly reveal more of the beauty, history, and culture found here in Alaska. And if you've enjoyed this video and want to support more adventures like this, then consider joining us on patreon.com slash lifestyle overland. All these fine folks you see here are what keeps this story going. Thank you, patrons, for your continued support. All right, guys. What a day. Great day. So much to see. All right. Rain is moving in. So we're snuggling into bed. Had a decent time tonight. I think yeah, it's I'm pretty proud of us. About 9 o'clock or so. A little after. So we're going to get a good, heavy night's sleep, maybe a lazy morning. And you'll see what else we can find. We got some fun stuff coming up. So, we'll see you guys later. Peace! <laughs>